Good evening! This is Bell Geode, and we are back with some Microsoft Flight Simulator X Steam Edition Vietnam Era. So here we are somewhere in the Gulf of Tonkin, just off the coast of North Vietnam, and we are on board the Nimitz. And today we're going to be reenacting one of the most famous bridge attacks of the Vietnam War, that being the bombing of Tan Hoa, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, bridge in North Vietnam, which was like a major, major, major artery that the NVA were using to supply South Vietnamese Viet Cong. We'll be flying the Ling Temco Vought A7 Corsair II, one of the most famous aircraft of its period in the Navy, and actually the plane that dealt the final blow to this bridge. Now, this particular FSX version is brought to us by the incomparable Razbam Sims. You may have heard that name before. They've done a lot of top-notch planes, and if you look around the cockpit, you'll see this one is no slacker at all. And they also um, put together the Mirage 2000 for DCS World as well. Let's take like a closer look here at the cockpit. You can see everything. There's a lot of fidelity put into it. A lot of these buttons, switches, dials, everything works in this plane. The manual alone is like 60 some pages long. So it's not going to be one of those where you just hop in there and go. You're going to want to sit down and take some time through this manual here. Look at the uh, radar at the top there. That has several different modes that actually work. And that gray screen that you see there with push on the one side and reset, that's a rolling map, basically a precursor to GPS. It's all in here, folks. It's all in here. There's a nav computer. You'll see it with like a whole bunch of zeros there. We're going to be using that to program in our destination and all of that. It's going to be a really fun episode. That's all I can tell you. And as usual, I will be going through the history of this aircraft as well in real life, you know, giving you an idea of some of the various squadrons that used it, and of course the infamous attack on Tan Hoa Bridge, as well as the operational history of the aircraft. But first, if we're going to do a bombing run, we're going to need some bombs. Now before we begin, I must hasten to add that Razbam actually has two versions of this. There's the regular version that I'm flying, which right now is on sale for like 10 bucks, and by right now I mean January 2016. And they also have a TAC Pack version for those who have the TAC Pack add-on for FSX. But on this plane, here's how we're going to attach weapons. This is what Razbam calls the Armament Station Control Unit. And it's real simple to operate. As long as you make sure your engine's shut down, your parking brakes are on, you can add armament by clicking on the buttons. So I'm clicking on the right side now, and as you can see, we're adding some Mark 82 bombs. Now, we can also make up to six on the bomb racks, and you see it'll actually put them on there. So for this particular mission, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to have six on the inboard pylons, and on the outboard pylons, I'm going to have three apiece. So let's continue on the port side here. We'll work on adding three bombs outboard. There we go. And then we'll mirror what we have on the port side, port side with the starboard side as well. The X's that you see there stand for mechanical fusing. You can set this thing up for either mechanical or electrical fusing. And of course the T's are those drop tanks, the wing fuel tanks that we've got. So yeah, this sucker's pretty much ready to go, and our AI companion, our wing leader, should also have been armed while we did this. If you take a look, there is a lot of faithful reproduction put into this stuff here, so really, I, my hat goes off to Razbam. They did a stunning job. There is very little to complain about with this aircraft. It's very well designed, and the flight handling is perfect. And as you can see, our number one plane is already loaded for bear. My only slight quibble is, since I do use uh, FS Recorder to do these, to get the uh, AI flight going as well, the one thing they don't do is they don't fold the wings, which is unfortunate, but, you know, I don't think that's going to detract from the episode. So we are ready to go. Our red shirts have us armed. Our purple shirts, or grapes, have us fueled. Uh, we've spoken to the plane captain, he signed off on everything, so let's go ahead and get this bird started up and get out of here. 
We're going to hop back into the cockpit while this guy gets his little push cart out of the way here. And then we'll get this bird started and get the show on the road. Alright, first thing we want to do is start up the engine. Pretty straightforward. You hit the regular switch for that, which I believe is Shift E, if I'm not too mistaken. No, it's not Shift E, it's Control E. So yeah, we'll zoom in a little bit and you can see the engine packs right there. Uh, that thing that says TIT, that's not quite what you think. It actually stands for the turbine intake temperature. So get your minds out of the gutter. Okay, so everything should be spooling up now. We'll set everything else in a moment here. Now that we have that up and running, we're going to want to peer over at the left-hand side and get our radar up. That'll be the top radar, the terrain-following radar. We've got oxygen on. They did not mirror any um, hypoxia situations, to the best of my knowledge. I tried, but I can't seem to black out. But we just set the radar on, and I'm going to put the range to about 40 nautical miles out. So we'll see that in a moment. You'll see it starts its sweep there. It's actually picking up all the islands off the coast of North Vietnam right now. And as we move closer, it'll start zooming in on the area that we're going to be flying to. Now while that's going on, I'm also setting my ordnance to dive toss. And we're going to work on the trimmers here. You'll see the pitch, the roll, and the yaw trimmers. So I'm going to basically level those out. In other words, I'm going to disable it because I like having manual control of the aircraft here. We'll also turn on the landing lights. Something tells me that might come in handy. We also have uh, the rest of the external lights that we can turn on as well. I'll also need to set the altimeter before we launch, but I'll do that a little later. Now, if you look at the bottom center of the screen where the HSI is, you'll see it currently says 6306 nautical miles to our destination. Uh, that's not right. So here's what we've, we're going to do. We're going to use the navigation computer that they put in here. This is a little bit of a pain in the butt. You have to manually turn these knobs to get your destination. It starts with all zeros and you got to go all the way up to the correct latitude and longitude. The top figures that you see, 1960 North, 106, 29 East, that is our current location. And right now I'm setting our target's location, which is 1950 North and 105, 47 East. You gotta turn this by hand, folks, and they deliberately left it that way because they wanted that to be a more authentic representation of the aircraft. What I'm doing now is I'm setting the TACAN, which I happen to know for this particular aircraft carrier is uh, 057 X-Ray. You can barely see the numbers changing, but we've got it set and turned on. Those numbers that you see near the bottom that are moving, that's the wind speed. It is picking up what's going on in FSX, so the wind direction is shifting. I'm also going to set the lights. I want uh, both my anti-collision lights on, top and bottom. Anti-ice I want on because we're going to need to fly high to get in there and avoid the SAMs. And I think that's just about everything that I need to set on this side. I'm not going to worry about too many of the other stuff because they're not mission critical. Okay, the yaw stabilization is not turned on. And of course the wings are folded. Uh, the V that you see there indicates our generator's running, obviously, because the engine's on. And now I have the yaw stabilization on, which is also going to help us with the autopilot, in case I should need to turn that on. I'm going to try and see if I can do it without the autopilot, though. Alright, uh, let's see. I'm thinking that's about everything. Oh, wait, no. Yes, we need to set the HSI. Okay, so remember it said 6,000 something miles, now it only says 51 miles in the upper left corner of the HSI. And I happen to know for a fact that our heading from the boat is about 315, so I'm going to want to set my course selector and my heading selector in that direction. You don't have to set both, but I kind of like having both there because it gives me like a clearer view when I zoom up. To the left of that you'll see the armament stations. We'll arm the bombs once we actually get up there. And I'm also setting our track to 51 miles out. That's for the rolling map so that it has an idea of where we're headed. You can see the little GPS map there. Or proto-GPS, I should say. Alright, according to the Airboss, we're ready to go. And it looks like so is our number one. Dude, your, your wings really need to be folded when you do that. 
Oh my god. Damn near sliced my nose off. Look at that crap. <laughs> it's a good thing this is a flight simulator. Holy crap, somebody would have gotten reamed out for that one. Alright, but we are ready to go, so I'm going to cut it and come back on the catapult. Alright, so we've got both planes set. I am on the number two cat. He's on the number one. We're going brakes down, throttles up. And we're going to get ready for the word to launch. Okay, our cat officer says we are good to go. I'm going to look to the right and see. Yep, our wing leader is ready. As soon as he launches, we are like one second behind him. So here we go, folks. Here we go. And we're off. Gear up, flaps up. Now for this entire mission, we're going to stay trail until we begin ingressing to the target. Then I am going to take the lead and drop the first bombs on the bridge. And number two will be directly behind us. Or I guess technically it's number one, but you know what I mean. Alright, so everything looks set for us to go. And I'm just going to slide up behind him about a mile or two. And we're just going to go single file to hide our numbers something like that. <laughs> Alright, looks like he's sufficiently far enough away, so I'm going to give it a little bit of juice. You do not want to keep this aircraft at maximum throttle position for longer than six seconds, otherwise you will overheat. That's where that TIT gauge comes in, and when that happens, your engine will shut off. It's a bitch to turn back on, let me just tell you. Alright, but now that we're airborne, let's get into the history of this aircraft. The A-7 had its first flight on the 26th of September in 1965. It was introduced into service February 1967, and it stayed in service until about 1991 with the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy, 93 with the Air National Guard. There are some countries that still used it up until as recent as 2014, for example, the Hellenic or Greek Air Force. Now, this aircraft was pretty much tailor-made to replace the Douglas A-1 Sky Raider, which we've seen before. It was the very first aircraft, or one of the very first aircraft that I showed you guys. As you can imagine, this aircraft actually cut its teeth in Vietnam. It was just in time to see a lot of combat and conflict in that theater. Now, one of the really fun things about this aircraft is the engine that it used. It used the Pratt & Whitney TF30-P-6 turbofan. Now, if that sounds vaguely familiar to you, that's the same exact engine that was in the original F-14 Tomcat Alpha model, only without the afterburner. Now, of course, this plane being like emergent technology, it was pretty much on the cutting edge at that time. You know, it had like a lot of state-of-the-art avionics that would eventually get used in aircraft like the Tomcat and like the F-111 and whatnot. But even though it had the same engine, one of the things that they discovered when they first got to Vietnam was the heat and the humidity would rob this aircraft of power. The pilots would always complain that they didn't have enough engine thrust. And in addition to which, as far as carrier operations, this thing, when it would take off at basically max speed, it would lose about 20 knots immediately after takeoff. So they had to take off like 4,000 pounds below their max takeoff rate. So basically they couldn't carry a full tank of gas. So of course, you know, naturally they did like a lot of air-to-air -air refueling and so on once they had completed their mission. We don't have that problem, however. We're actually pretty much set up with the drop tank, so we're pretty good to go right now. It's not that humid today. All right, now, we are starting to ingress towards our location. So you can see in the top center here, the radar map is zooming down. That is a terrain following radar. I have it in uh, GMS mode, I believe is what RASBAM says it's called, which stands for ground map shaped. But there's like several different ways that you can set this thing up and it all looks really freaking sweet. All right, pretty soon I'm going to be using the armament controls that you see in the lower left-hand corner here. We're going to flip up the pylon switches for the individual pylons. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. First, we've got to go north. 
Yeah, I just realized that we were traveling a little too far south. We're looking for the mouth of a river and a island, an island in the center. And actually, I think I can see it right now. Look off to the left of the screen there. You'll see this oval-shaped island. That's where we're trying to head to. We're going to follow that river up to where the bridge is. So I'm going to stay behind one here. And once I am back in position, we'll go inside and get this sucker armed so we can get ready to drop these bombs. This is going to go by pretty quickly here. So now comes the fun part. We get to arm our pylon. So we're going to arm eight, seven, as well as two and one. We're going to set the master arm, which is in the lower right-hand corner, to armed. And we're going to set our quantity to all of them. So we're pretty much set to go. If you recall, I've got it set for dive toss. So we're actually going to do a dive toss. There's our island there. So we're going to hang a left right here. And you'll notice two on my screen off to the right. He's going to continue going forward for a few more seconds, and then he's going to pull up behind us, and we're going to do this in rapid succession. Boom, boom, boom. It's going to be a lot of boom flowers, is all I can tell you. But since it is FSX, you won't actually see the explosion, so sorry about that. However, just between you and I, this aircraft is also going to be in DCS World. Shh, it's a secret. All right, let me tell you a little bit about the actual history of this real attack as we make our way in. So the date was October the 6th, 1972, when this bridge was finally destroyed. And it was destroyed by four U.S. Navy A-7s from Attack Squadron VA-82 on board the USS America. They delivered approximately 8,000 pounds of high explosive with two planes carrying 2,000-pound uh, walleyes and the other two carrying uh, 2,000 pounds in Mark 84 general purpose bombs. We're actually using Mark 82s, but that's only because RASBAM doesn't have 84s for this sucker. Needless to say, this thing was a bitch to destroy. It took several years before they finally could wipe it off of the target list. All right, I'm going to pull out the uh, speed brakes here. Here we go. Keep our speed manageable. And we are dead on target, so it is time! Bombs away! And looks like the last two got stuck. Whoops! <laughs> I don't think it's really going to matter at this point. And there we go! Big bada boom flower. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Now to say that the uh, U.S. military was obsessed with this bridge is pretty much an understatement. This bridge was absolutely critical to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was like their main artery into South Vietnam that allowed them to arm the uh, Viet Cong. And they spent from 1968 to 1972 uh, during Operation Linebacker trying to blow this sucker up. And finally, when the A-7 Corsairs permanently destroyed that sucker did they take it off the target list but they lost about 104 American pilots throughout the time frame that they've been launching sorties on this thing a total of about 873 air sorties were expended against this bridge and it was literally hit by hundreds of bombs and missiles before finally being destroyed it was basically a symbol of you know North Vietnamese resistance so they had to take it down. They just had to. But VA-82 did do a sterling job on finally killing this bridge. Uh, VA-82 is known as the Marauders. Now, the aircraft that we're flying is not a part of that particular squadron. However, it was one of the first squadrons that was in Vietnam. And actually, a total of about 27 naval squadrons ended up uh, going to Vietnam over the course of the war. All right, well, our job is done, and I'm going to take a quick look at one here. Okay, he is egressing. Looks like he was a little late on target, but I'm pretty sure he was able to, des to deliver his munitions and get out of there before being shot down by surface-to-air missiles. So we are taking the high road, and we are not stopping until we see the carrier. So far, I don't see any MiGs coming after us, so I'm thinking we're going to make a clean getaway, but make no bones about it, during Vietnam, this thing was a target for MiGs. It actually can hold sidewinders strapped to the sides of the fuselage, and that's one of the options that I didn't show you in the um, little weapons loading tool that uh, 
Raspam has given us. This plane was designed to look very similar to its bigger brother, whom it's often confused with. Its bigger brother is the F-8 Crusader. Now, one of the key things with the Crusader that was not included with the Corsair II was the fact that the Crusader's wing could actually hinge itself. They call it a variable incidence wing. So on landing, instead of uh, you know deploying flaps and whatnot, they would raise up the wing so they would have like a higher angle of attack. This aircraft didn't need it because it had a slightly longer wingspan. Come to think of it, speaking of which, let me give you some hard facts on this aircraft. Of course, it has a crew of one. Some versions had crews of two, most notably the um, electronic warfare versions. Its length was 46 feet 2 inches, wingspan of about 38 feet 9 inches, and a height of about 16 feet. I already told you the kind of engine that it initially had, the same exact one as the Tomcat. It was eventually upgraded to the Allison TF41-A-2, which some of the later versions of this aircraft used. It had a maximum performance, maximum speed of 600 knots or 690 miles per hour. That's uh, 1,111 kilometers per hour. Um, it had a range of about 1,070 nautical miles, a ferry range of 1,342 nautical miles. That's with all the drop tanks and everything. Service ceiling about 42,000 feet, and I can tell you right now we are just under 20,000. As far as armament, it had a built-in M61A1 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon with about uh, 1,030 rounds. It also had six hard points under the wing and, of course, the two fuselage pylon stations that I told you about for mounting the sidewinders. Total capacity of about 15,000 pounds and it could launch various things such as rockets, such as Zuni rockets or Shrike uh, anti-radiation missiles, walleyes, of course, which is what they ultimately used on the bridge, and eventually the Maverick and the Harm missiles. And, of course, a lot of bombs. This was one of the many aircraft that was capable of dropping nuclear bombs as well. Alright, so as you can see this sucker was indeed one impressive aircraft and it also developed the rather lovely nickname of the Slough. You may have noticed the title of this episode is called just that, Slough. What the hell does Slough stand for? Well, if you pardon my French, according to its uh, naval pilots, this aircraft was called the Short Little Ugly Fucker. Slough. <laughs> Only Navy guys could come up with that one. Okay, so here's the carrier. So it's about time to start heading down. And we are going to do the usual carrier break and come in. I'm going to have... Uh, I'm going to have number one come in first. I'm going to slow down here because it looks like he's actually closer to the ships. And then we're going to go a beam and head behind the ship. And we'll take our place behind number one here. I had mentioned before that the U.S. Air Force also used this aircraft. They were kind of a latecomer to the game. Uh, they really didn't want to take on another Navy-designed aircraft, but they were ultimately convinced when they insisted that it have a more powerful engine than what the Navy had. So they're the ones that started using the Allison TF-41A1 turbofan engines, which was actually a licensed-built version of a Rolls-Royce engine called the Spade. It offered 14,500 pounds of thrust, which was roughly over 2,000 pounds greater than the TF-30 that the Navy had. The Air Force also insisted that they must have a heads-up display. You may have noticed all I had in this sucker was a gun sight. And they also wanted updated avionics as well as the rotary cannon that I just mentioned previous. The Navy version really only had the 20mm uh, cannons. And then, of course, the other thing that the Air Force had to have in this was a computerized navigation and weapons system, weapons delivery system with the uh, AN slash APQ 126 radar and the heads up display that came with it. So, basically, this aircraft became like the test bed for a lot of emergent technology that would become standard issue in later generations. And hang on a second, let me see if I can locate the ship. Okay, there we go. Alright, now after Vietnam, uh, this aircraft did see a lot of extra duty. It was in Grenada when we invaded Grenada back in, uh, when was that, 83 I believe. 
It was in Lebanon. It was in Libya. And, of course, it was in Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Now, one interesting thing that I found out about this aircraft. You remember the F-117 Nighthawk, right? Otherwise known as the Wobbly Goblin. Well, while they were developing this thing, they didn't actually have any training aircraft for their pilots, so they used A-7 Corsair IIs as the training aircraft for the pilots who would eventually end up flying the F-117. So these guys basically had to trust that it was going to be the same pilot workload, even though the avionics were obviously going to be different. They did outfit them a little bit differently so that the pilots could at least get used to some of the technology that they would be using. But this was the plane that taught them how to fly the Nighthawk. And then, of course, they just hopped into that plane, went to Desert Storm, and you know, <laughs> the rest, as they say, is history. Of course, like any good military story, there are two sides to it. In addition to being the training aircraft for the pilots that would end up flying the F-117, they also made sure to deliberately park these suckers at the airbase so that any passing Russian spy satellites would see the A-7 Corsair IIs and not the F-117. So they were also used for deception purposes, because obviously we didn't want the Russians to know we had the F-117 before the sucker was ready. Anyway, as you can see, this aircraft had a very long and distinguished career. Not too shabby for something that was named after a World War II aircraft, which, not surprisingly, is my absolute favorite of the World War II aircraft. And as beloved as this aircraft was, it sure took a lot of ribbing. Pilots used to say, it's not very fast, but it sure is slow. Not surprisingly, when women started being transitioned into combat aircraft, uh, this was one of the first aircraft that they gave them. I don't know, I guess it was like a hand-me-down type of thing. It's got a face only a mother could love, but I tell you what, you can't help but fall in love with this little bird. It's so cool, and such a stable bombing platform, as you've seen. Okay, so, enough of my yakking about the history of this aircraft. Let's see if we can bring it home. One's already got his gear down. Uh, technically, he's got his hook down, but again, a limit limitation with uh, FS Recorder, it doesn't seem to capture that aspect of it. So we're going to have to make believe that the hook is down and he's getting ready to come in on final here. We, of course, are going downwind and I've got everything in landing configuration right now. So it's only a matter of time before one finishes his turn and he's on the deck and out of our way so we can come in. I've kept the little inset going so that you can see one landing for two reasons. One, because it's so cool to see the other plane. And two, I want to show you one of the little quirks with Razbam's version of this aircraft. Now, I love the work that Razbam has done, and I cannot wait to get the Mirage, which is probably going to happen within, like, the next couple of weeks or so. And then I'll bring that into DCS rotation. But... Since I got this aircraft, I noticed one of the key things with it is when landing on a carrier, this thing has a tendency to stand on its nose. I have no idea how that came about or why that came about, but you're going to see that now once one hits the deck. So he is pulling into final position right now. You can probably see him off to the right there. Uh, yeah, he should be popping up any second. There he goes, there he goes. Okay, so he is probably about a mile or so away from the carrier. He's about to call the ball. And watch what happens when he comes in for a landing here. This is absolutely freaking hilarious. I was able to fix the issue for my own benefit by changing the aircraft CFG. Basically, I had to tweak the tail hook position so that it wasn't so close to the center of gravity. I don't know why that was an oversight on the part of Razbam, but it definitely helped. Alright, now, first off, you'll notice that our AI pilot's landing is a little bit high. But watch what happens here. <laughs> what the hell? Seriously? <laughs> yeah. That was before I fixed the aircraft CFG, <laughs> and I decided to keep that in there because it just looked so comical. Now, as soon as he gets off of the flight line there, the landing platform, 
we're gonna go ahead and come in. So I'm making my turn to final right now, and you better hurry up and get off that deck. Okay, let me just check to see where the carrier is. All right, there's our destroyer escort. Carrier should be popping up any minute now. I'm still looking. I'm still looking. And it looks like one's finally getting off the deck. Okay, so as soon as one gets off the deck, I'm going to turn off the inset here. And there's the carrier, right underneath my port navigation light. Okay, he is off the deck. Good deal. Time to bring this sucker in. I think we are just far enough to starboard that I can start turning in towards the Canta deck. And of course, I'm going to need to check outside real quick. Okay, where's the boat? There's the boat. Okay, looking good. There's a better view. Yeah, looks like we're just about lined up. Now, I'm going to make sure to come down a little bit lower so that way I don't have to, like, do a bonsai dive onto the deck here. kind of want to make this landing a little bit better than the last landing was. And we are definitely within the weight parameters. Uh, you have to lose a lot of gas before you can think about bringing this sucker down. Because it's so small and so light, yeah, you, you definitely want to pay attention to what weight you have when you're coming in to land. Because this thing is going to come down to roughly about 125 knots, thereabouts. Right now I've got it um, between 130 and 140. And I'm still trying to keep everything on speed. Similar to planes like the L-39 Albatross, this thing has a long spool up time. So you got to make sure you manage your engine go below 100, this thing will literally fall out of the sky. So I'm trying to keep the nose up just a touch here. Uh, it's definitely going to be an interesting landing. I'm not perfect with this, so I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. Right now it says I'm going a little too fast, but I'm trying to line up the meatball. I'm calling the ball right now. Okay, a little bit more to the left. Start dropping some speed because I can see the flashing red lights indicating I'm going too fast. There we go. Now we're going a little slow, but that will also help us lose some altitude here. And here we go. Nice! Three wire trap, and I didn't have to do a handstand. <laughs> I love it! <laughs> Okay, so now that we're down, we're going to go ahead and put the hook up. And we'll go ahead and put the flaps up while we're at it here. And once the flaps are up, I am going to go ahead and fold the wings. Wings are coming up now. Alright, another successful mission here in Vietnam. We took one pesky bridge down that caused so much aggravation for so many years. So we're going to puff our way over to the starboard side of the carrier and we're going to pull up next to one and we're going to call this one done. So I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this mission in this incredible bird. Like I said, Razbam has it on sale right now on their website. The link should be in the description. It'll also be in the credits. And you can get this sucker for about 10 bucks. If you want the Tac Pack version, it is 30 bucks. That's of course American currency. And that is as of January 2016. I don't know when you're actually watching this, but if it's later than that, I can't guarantee that pricing. But that having been said, is it worth purchasing? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It is such an awesome bird, and it's been my pleasure to fly this sucker. Alright. Parking brake is set. So let's go ahead and turn everything off, and we will call it done. As always, I thank you for watching my episode. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed it and, of course, learned something at the same time. We will have another episode coming up. I haven't decided yet whether or not we're going to be continuing the journey with me and Allie heading out west or if we're going to do another Vietnam episode, so it'll be a surprise to you as well as to me. But be that as it may, if you'd like to see more, be sure to subscribe, and that way you'll get notifications as to when I put these suckers online, as well as any of the other games that I play, such as DCS World, um, Fallout 4, Star Wars The Old Republic, even Black Desert, which of course is also coming. 
Let me open up the cockpit here. Cockpit canopy. There we go. All right, so from sunny Vietnam, I thank you for joining me, and I will catch you on the next one. Ciao.